My name's Kurt Johnstone, and you're watching On The Trial. Today, we're gonna to be patching up a textured ceiling for quite an important lady. Come on, let's go. Shoes off on the nice carpet. Okay, so, there's been a leak from the loft. It came through and caused this section of the ceiling to fall away. We've checked the rest of the ceiling, and it all seems quite sound. It's fairly solid, but this is shot. Now, we've got a few options. There's lime wash paint under this Artex. And that means that we can't put plaster straight onto the Artex because it'll pull away, the weight will pull it down. So we can either rip down the whole ceiling, which the customers didn't want. We could overboard the whole ceiling and plaster it, which they also didn't want. It's, it's too much mess, it's too much hassle for them. And ultimately these may be getting changed in the near future. So what the plan is now is to just repair this section of the ceiling, which leaves me the task, <laughs> the interesting task of trying to make it match the rest of the ceiling, which I don't know how they've created that texture, but we're sure gonna find out. What can happen is when you're pulling down loose plaster, you can weaken good sound solid plaster that it's joined to. So the way to counteract that is to cut it with your plasterer's hammer so it forms a nice clean line where it breaks away. So this house belongs to a lovely couple and the lady of the house is called Lynn. Lynn is really quite a special lady who I've known for many, many years since I was a young boy. But I'll tell you more about Lynn and why she's so special a bit later in the video. to clear out in between the laps so that our fresh plaster can go in there and, and get a good key. I've scraped out and cleaned out between the laths and now I'm just giving it a little brush to get all the little bits of debris off it. Now there's a few ways of fixing holes like this. We could, we could place a piece of plasterboard in this hole. Um, now, the thing with doing that is, over here, we're down to about, I don't know, a quarter of an inch thick. This section here is about an inch thick. It's all different thicknesses, so ultimately, even if I plasterboard it, I've got to level it up with some back coat plaster to get it to the right levels. So what I think we're going to do instead, just to change things up a little bit, is just replaster over this. So it's important if you're going to replaster over laths that you clean out between the laths because the way this works is the plaster goes up in these little gaps and then mushrooms over the top. So if you leave all the chunks of plaster in the in the in the centre of these in the little bits in the section, in the, get your words out. If you leave plaster in the middle of these, it can't do that. And ultimately, plaster doesn't stick to wood. But the way this works is the plaster is keyed around it. So I'm just give a little brush down now. I'll put a little bit of seal on, just so the back coat of plaster seals well to the original plaster. And then we'll be ready to put a first coat on. I'm going to seal the edge of the plaster where I'm going to join onto just to stop. The plaster shrinking away. What plaster has a tendency to do when it meets something dry, it causes your plaster, the wet plaster, to shrink. So you end up with a crack right around the patch. So if you seal it, that stops that happening. Another thing I'm going to do is I'm going to seal the front of these laths. Not because I think that the plaster is going to stick to the wood, but it's just going to calm the dust down a little bit, It'll make these a little bit less dusty so that. Again, it doesn't cause the plaster to shrink up by absorbing loads of moisture. You could do a similar thing with water. It just so happens that I've got SPR to hand, so that's why I'm using that. Now, you would have thought my cameraman, Callum, would tell me that I've got black soot all over my face, but instead, he just let me walk around for the rest of the day looking like a chimney sweep. As well as sealing inside the patch where the new plaster is going to go, I'm also going to seal around the edge of the patch 
so I can feather the new plaster out across the old ceiling just a little bit to help it blend in. Up to now, we've removed all of the loose plaster. Everything else is fairly solid. Bear in mind that lath and plaster is springy by nature. So just because it flexes a little bit doesn't mean it's loose. We've removed all the loose. We've cleaned out between the laths so that our fresh plaster can go up and between the laths. We've sealed the edge and around the ceiling with SBR, neat. I just use it neat and don't water it down. I've also sealed the front of the laths. Now, I've sealed them because I want to stop the dust causing any delamination and shrinking the plaster up too much with its dryness. <clears throat> it's something that's maybe not necessary, maybe some fellas wouldn't do it. I just think I've already got the stuff out, I'll do it. Yeah, it causes the stuff to drip down your arms a little bit because it drips out the laths, but whatever. Now, what I'm going to do now is put the first coat of plaster on, the pricking up coat. Now, ultimately, it would be good if we use the same product as what's already up there, lime plaster. But that's not readily available anymore. So, we've got a choice of all the modern plasters that we have nowadays. The plaster I'm going to use for the pricking up coat is going to be drywall adhesive. Okay, the reason I've chose drywall adhesive as opposed to bonding coat or hardwall or any other back coat plaster is solely for the fact that this doesn't shrink as much when it meets up to old plaster. It sort of handles high suction quite well. That's one reason. Second reason is it dries quite hard, so when it laps over the laths, I'm not worried about it breaking off as easy as this old plaster has done. The stuff that's behind the laths and the stuff on the fronts has come apart. This is quite a strong product, so that's why I'm choosing to use dry wall adhesive for the first count. That'll get the laths covered. It'll cause the mushrooming effect inside the laths. We're going to let that go off a little bit, but then I don't want to add too much weight. So for the second coat, to bring it down level, I'll then use bonding coat because that's lightweight plaster. Right, enough of me talking, let's just get it done. Okay, so that's about the consistency you want to be using this. Because we want it to be able to go up between the laths. But we don't want it too wet that it drips out and we don't want it too thick that it won't go through. So that's about the consistency. Now the first thing we're going to do, before I start spreading it on these, is I'm going to go round and tow it in to all the existing seal. I'm trying to squeeze it in and really press it in so it gets a good bond to what is already up there. I'm almost pushing it in behind it a little bit. If this was a listed building, we would have had to replace the materials like for like with what was there originally. That would have been sand, lime and hair. It may have had a little bit of gypsum plaster in there as well to help set off the lime. And the hair would have come from an animal. These days we use a product called polypropylene, which is just a synthetic imitation version of hair. So now you can see, just take them round, show them like that. Now you can see, it's all been squeezed in. It's all been squeezed in around. And you see the sheen on the laths. Now, ultimately, I would love to get above this and brush it all off. But show them that. See that? There's a loft hatch. And up there, come back to me. <laughs> come back to me. <laughs> up there, they've boarded all the floor out. So, even if we went up there, the whole floor is boarded out. All the Christmas decorations, everything's up there. There's no way I can get to the back of this patch. So we've just got to do the best as what we can from below. Now I'll give you a little tip for when you're plastering over lath. Look at the way the, the laths run. If you spread the material across this way, it'll be a weak first coat because your trial will go in and out of all these little laths as it's going and it causes weakness. Okay, so if you go that way, if you try and spread the gear that way, the material tends to go up and then fall back out of the little gaps between the laths. So, the only way to do it, I mean, it doesn't really matter on a tiny little patch like this, even though I don't want it in your hair. The only way to do it 
is to go diagonally across the lats. So when you put the material on, you want to start there and go diagonally across like this. Now, I'm trying to push quite a bit of stuff in because I want it to go up and cling on the other side. So you're pressing a little bit harder than what you usually would because you're trying to push the material through the lats. where the plaster has overspilled onto the old ceiling. I'm just gonna wash that off a little bit. I know a lot of fellas would have liked to have just put a piece of plasterboard right in the middle of this hole, and that would have been fine, you know, that's another way to do it. But the thing is, round the edge of the plasterboard still would have needed filling, and I still wouldn't be able to you won't cut a plasterboard perfectly to the shape of that hole so it'll still need filling around the edges and it'd need filling to adhere the plasterboard to the old ceiling because you want to help strengthen what is staying up there so with that in mind if i'm gonna have to wait for that to set anyway i may as well do the whole patch like this there we go now the only thing left to do now is to let this set but before we leave it we've got to put a key in it now notice as well, the scratches have to go diagonally across the laths. Also, you can't go the same way as the laths because you'll weaken the plaster. Let me show you. Let's show you what it looks like now. Oh, that's it. Well keyed. So the next coat of bonding coat, the lightweight plaster, will stick to that, no problem at all. So I want to tell you a little bit about Lynn. This is Lynn's bedroom. Now, Lynn, I've known Lynn since I was like knee high to a grasshopper. Since I was in primary school, I've known Lynn. Lynn's been one of my mum's friends. Seems like forever. Now, I don't want to go into too much detail, but I want to give you a little bit of an insight. My old man and my mum had a bit of a rocky relationship. And I love the bones of my mum and my dad. I love them both just the same. What I would say is, my dad is what he calls old school. And he's the sort of guy, you know, he wouldn't sort of let you down. I never had to worry about someone picking on me when I was a kid. Because I know for a fact my dad would be straight round their house, you know, telling their dad straight. So that was just the type of guy he was. Sort of any, any problems were settled with his fists. Now, that's great, but he couldn't switch it off. So what that basically meant was growing up at home, we might have a bit of a tough time. Now, <clears throat> I wouldn't change a thing about my upbringing. Well, all I'll say is she had it quite tough. And what would sometimes happen is if my mum sort of um, confided in one of her family and they said something, my dad would go after them. So... <laughs> What, what tended to happen was my mum was quite isolated in, in a way, in a way. And Lynn, my mum worked with Lynn, and Lynn turned out to be one of those friends to my mum that she was like a ride or die type of friend, you know. So when things got a bit hot, um, Lynn stood her ground and she wasn't intimidated and she stuck by my mum. And ultimately, Lynn stood by my mum when my mum needed a friend when she needed someone to lean on Lynn was there so I know that Lynn supported my mum quite a lot when I was just a, a, a little lad and I don't feel indebted to her but I've got a lot of respect for her she's been a good solid sort of friend of my mum's for many many years so that's who Lynn is okay so we're going to leave that to set now we don't want it to dry out we're not going to leave it for days we're just going to leave it to set so it needs a couple of hours Whilst that's set, we're going to shoot off, going to have a look at another job, a little bit of lunch whilst we're out. But I want to show you something, so come with us. So if you remember last week, we fitted under my bonnet this little thing that TDI tuning sent to me. 
you have to let it run in and get used to your engine for at least 40 miles. So I've left it now for, what's it been? Almost a week. Can you see it down here? You can get a little app that you can control from your phone. Your Bluetooth from your phone can actually control this thing from inside. But I haven't bothered because I, I need all the space on my phone I can get for these videos. So I haven't bothered installing the app. So at the minute it's on one. There's seven settings, it's on one. So that means it's the most fuel efficient. Now if I put it to seven, that means it's gonna be the most, it's gonna give me the most power. You see now it does a little flashy thing right there. When it does that, that lets you know it's successfully on number seven now. So, it'll still be more fuel efficient than not having it, but now we'll have a bit more power. So let's see what it's like. Okay, so ultimately, I've been a van driver my whole life. I've never actually owned a car, although I've bought loads of cars. I buy them for other people like my missus and my mum, but I've always just drove vans, so I'm a slow driver, is what I'm trying to say. But that said, although I don't put my foot down, it's still nice to just have a little bit of poke, isn't it, when you pull off? It's so much faster. It's like talky, that's the best way I can describe it. It's like talky. It just feels like you've got loads of pulling power. So whilst we've got a bit of time to spare, we've come down to meet a friend of mine who's got a few rental properties. We're looking at some work for him today and then we're going to get a quick bite to eat and then hopefully by then we can get back to the job and that first coat of plaster will have set so we can get started. How are we doing? Okay, so usually I get about 27 miles per gallon. You know, I've noticed now, um, just driving the same, I get about 32 miles per gallon, uh, just standard driving round. Now it does differ, like when I go on the motorway, it seems to get a lot more miles per gallon, but driving around the side streets, so we'll potentially do even more tests on this, but the fuel efficiency of that little box is basically blow my mind because I can't understand how that thing is making me van faster and save me fuel at the same time. Anyway, we've just been to look at a job and we've just been for something to eat. We're going to come back now, see if this blaster's set, ready for another coat. And whilst we were out, I picked these up because I noticed that Lynn's bathroom light switch wasn't working and she's got like a little, um, a little battery powered light in the bathroom. So... I'm going to see um, if we can just change the switch for her, get it working. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. Say hello, Callum. <laughs> so this is what we found. When we pull this cord, it doesn't click on and off. What I found that Lynn's been doing is she's put these little things all around the bathroom that light up. These little battery, they were like stuck on the tiles everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> they're quite good, I'm quite impressed, because they've got their own little light switch, there's little batteries, look at this. Whoa, there you go, and you can turn it off here. So that's cool, but anyway, we're going to fix this as a little surprise for her. Although I don't work as an electrician, I did go to college for a few years to train to be one. Okay, the moment of truth. Now, come in. Let's see if it works. Hey! Now, Lynn... <laughs> She's only little, she's only about so high, but she's not down here, so I think we'll heighten this up to her out there. Oh, yeah. Light switch. Oh. There we go. Little surprise for her. Okay, now come here and look at this. Can you see the dark patches in this? Dark bits. Some bits, see these dark bits? Some bits are still wet. Adhesive flash sets, so when you were with finishing plastic, it sets slowly over time. Adhesive just goes off. So these bits are set, these dark bits, and the bits next to it are still wet. But I know as soon as you start getting dark sections, that within 15 20 minutes, that whole thing's gonna be set. So now we know that that's nearly set, we're gonna start mixing up some bonding coat and we'll get this built down to the right level and see if we can't match this pattern a little bit. It's fine to start going over now. So 
whilst all this work's going on, Lynn and her husband, Kev, they've gone on a little break. They've gone away for a bit. Now, this hole's been like this in the ceiling for a little while. But that's partly my fault because I said, look, it's best that you aren't here when this happens because I don't know how much of the ceiling's going to have to come down and it could potentially be horrendous and very dusty. So I think as well, the fact that Lynn's basically sort of semi-retired now to take full advantage of any little breaks that he can get. I heard of my mum used to work in a canteen and a car plant, so you can imagine they did all sorts of crazy hours up at three o'clock in the morning and all sorts of crazy shifts. So I think now any little chance of a break is taken full advantage of. Now, if this was a usual patch, if this was a smooth ceiling, what I'll do now is I've brushed the edges in to help it feather in. I've took it back a little bit more so it's the same level as the original ceiling now. And what I'll do now is I'll let that pick up a little bit. As soon as that starts to set, I would skim it. But we're trying to match this. I don't even know what you would call this. And I don't even know how to obtain this finish, really. But I've got a bit of an idea how we're going to do it. Uh, or do the best job that we possibly can to make this sort of blend in. Um, but if you were going to skim the ceiling, this would be the stage you get up to. And then you would skim like a usual patch from this point forwards. Us on the other hand, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're probably going to have to do a little bit of cleaning down for this. This is probably the messiest thing you've probably ever seen me do. So what we found is the wetter you mix this, it matches the texture better. Um, this is how we're going to get the uh, the desired finish. It's not good. <laughs> but whoever did that originally. Must have been a lunatic. So, once we've completely splattered the whole room and cleaned up, we'll let you see the finished results. So the patch is finished now, and all that's left to do is to clean up and leave Lynn her invoice for the work we've done. That was exciting, doing that. Now, at the moment, this is a lot darker colour than this, so it looks heavier. But from where I'm stuck looking directly up at the texture, these textures are a very close match. I do know that when it's painted, it'll all blend in nice and you won't notice. Don't tell me misses you see me doing this. <laughs> right, now all that's left to do is to leave an invoice for Lynn. She's away on a little trip. And uh, this was all getting done while she was gone, so it'll just be, you know, she wouldn't be in the way and what have you. So we're going to leave her an invoice so we can sort this out when she gets back. There we go. Oh. Patch hole in bedroom ceiling. Replace light switch in bathroom. No money owed. Thanks for being a good friend to me, Mum, then. Don't realise how much of a difference you made.